Welcome everyone to our next lecture. This is Africans in English America and is one of three lectures that we were looking at this week dealing with the cultural and social identity of, of people living in the colonial world of the Americas, that is of the Western Hemisphere uh, in the age of European contact. Uh, early colonial America to be specific, the English mainland colonies of North America which came to include a diverse population of people with not only English uh, arrivals mixing then with Native American cultures and societies but the other great partner if you will in the rise of an Atlantic world that of, uh, of African people who, as we know from an earlier lecture, made up one of the great migrations of history, a great forced migration, an unfree migration known as the Atlantic slave trade. And just how large a migration was this? Well, by 1820, nearly 8.5 million African immigrants had arrived in the Americas compared to only about 2.4 million Europeans. That is to say that almost 80% of those who had arrived in the Americas by 1820 had come not from Europe, not from England, uh, but rather from Africa as part of the great Atlantic slave trade, one of the tragic uh, chapters, let's be clear, a tragic chapter uh, of human enslavement, yet one which will see the arrival of African people and thus the arrival of African influences on the development of the New World societies and it's that story that we want to look at today that story of cultural survival and influence among a people who were largely enslaved their enslavement notwithstanding the migration of Africans put them at the very heart of America's story at the very heart of what we like to call the melting pot ever since pays to remember that today upwards of 150 million people of African descent live in the Western Hemisphere. They didn't go away, they didn't disappear, they weren't silent, uh, and as long as they were enslaved, they never had, nevertheless had uh, an opportunity to imprint themselves, their identities, their traditions, their cultures on the growing societies of the Americas. And so, yes, in answer to the question, did the slaves leave us a history through the efforts of historians, ethnographers, folklorists, and many others, we see the answer is yes, and that the voices of slaves indeed are heard in history. One only has to look for them, to listen for them, to find them. Some of these voices now are more familiar to us, more recognizable, because they were committed to print in traditional ways, found their their meter in volumes, such as that of, of Elade Equiano's first person memoir. Born in Africa, Equiano was kidnapped by slave traders as a teenager and eventually sold into the Atlantic world slave trade. A slave trade that he remembered for its, quote, tortures, murder, and every other imaginable barbarity and iniquity practiced upon the poor slaves with impunity. I hope the slave trade will be abolished, wrote Equiano. I pray it may be an event at hand. And it's true. This slave, uh, this, this new world slave, found his freedom, wrote his memoirs in the 1790s, told of his life, of his being kidnapped as a child in Nigeria and sold to slave traders eventually across the Atlantic where he was purchased by an English ship captain, a merchant shipper in the West Indies trade who taught him not only uh, the skills of navigation, of ship navigation, but eventually uh, Aquiano uh, learned English, uh, would convert to Christianity uh, and moved upon receiving his emancipation, one of the fortunate, you might say, to be emancipated, Equiano found his way to England where he lived the rest of his life and became something of a celebrity after publishing his memoirs, the interesting narrative of the life of Ala de Equiano. Other voices as well, famously the poet Phyllis Wheatley, like Equiano, kidnapped as a child in Africa, sold 
into the Atlantic slave trade, purchased by a, a Boston family that taught her to read and write. Eventually, she, like Equiano, received her emancipation, became a free person, married, and even wrote a volume of poetry, becoming one of the best known of America's colonial poets, where famously she employed her, fair, her, uh, her fellow Christians, white Christians, to remember Negroes, black as Cain, may be refined and join the angelic train. That is an appeal to see African people as human beings, uh, as, uh, as persons with souls who could be taught and, and uh, who could convert, in her case, to Christianity. Uh, Phyllis Wheatley reminds us that enslavement did not mean denial of identity. And though the case of Phyllis Wheatley and of Alaa de Equiano were perhaps unique, even extraordinary, uh, and set apart from the mass of their fellow Africans who did not find emancipation or freedom, who didn't perhaps even learn to read or write under the regime of slavery. Nevertheless, uh, a reminder, a clue really, a historical clue, uh, that these people retained their humanity retained their identity under the most difficult of circumstances. Uh, this wasn't simply a matter of having a, a kindly or friendly slave owner. Uh, uh, there's so much to say about the cruelties of slavery that even those who imagine themselves to be kindly uh, to their slaves really remained nevertheless slave owners, that is, traffickers in human bodies, human souls. And yet, despite the inhumanity of that commerce, that traffic in human beings, uh, the human spirit survives, the human spirit endures, and the likes of a, an Equiano or Phyllis Wheatley remind us that these voices from the past uh, call to the very uh, enduring spirit of Africa and its people. Their voices speak to us not only in the pages of poetry or the memoirs, uh, but, uh, but in other ways as well, less obvious ways African traditions merged with new world circumstances in the simple act of working of laboring uh, there could be African imprint African traditions for example song and musicality traditions the famous work songs of the slaves uh, that became so influential and so inspirational uh, to generations of American music Take the, uh, the song Shuck That Corn Before You Eat, which followed a, a traditional African call and response pattern with a caller shouting out the main line and a chorus answering him. All them pretty gals will be dar, saying the caller, Shuck that corn before you eat, responded the chorus. And, and to know this tradition of call and response is to see, for example, in the word shuck and the second syllable of before, a stress, a rhythmic stress that offered a cadence to the singers uh, as workers, a labor song that could be performed in cadence. At these points in the song, slaves knew to step forward on the right foot, grab the top of the corn with the left hand, and cut the top off with the right hand in a rhythmic flowing movement. In this way, all members of the group worked together to efficiently and quickly complete the task. So song and work merging song and musicality combining inspired by African origins and traditions. Here you see a group of boys uh, playing for the camera, if you will, uh, an improvised musical instrument. I mean, you know, it doesn't take much to remember that enslaved people in the Americas did not have the material means, the resources necessary to purchase finished instruments and thus improvised instruments like the earth bow that you see here, which was really a uh, a snare devised to catch small animals but with his feet on the lid and the stick bent over pulling the string taut uh, one could pluck it and create sounds musical sounds that echoed those of the old country of of africa of 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 earlier traditions whether stringed instruments scraping and percussion instruments drums ivory horns, etc. An entire musical ensemble really uh, will be transported amidst the, uh, you know, the horrors of the Atlantic slave trade. That is, as 
cultural commodities to be reborn in the Americas, inspiring musical traditions from South America to North America, from Brazilian samba to American jazz. These New World variants uh, will be uh, an enduring testimony. Here you see the wash tub bass, uh, similar to the earth drum or earth snare that we saw earlier. Uh, and the finished forms as banjos, fiddles, uh, etc. Inspiring traditions down to our own time. Hip-hop, jazz, blues, uh, rock and roll steeped in the African tradition. And really more than just ways of speaking or singing. An entire oral culture of African influence. Listen to the modern Nigerian author Shinwa Achebe. Whose novel Things Fall Apart. Classic novel of African, West African ways. Among the Igbo, the art of conversation is regarded very highly, and proverbs are the palm oil with which words are eaten, writes Achebe. Our elders say that the sun will shine on those who stand before it shines on those who kneel under them. That's a, tr a traditional African proverb. The sun will shine on those who stand before it shines on those who kneel under them. A reminder uh, to not be subservient, to not bow before others, uh, whether it be laboring under the, uh, the, the weight of debt or enslavement, to stand tall, to be recognized in the light of day. These sorts of proverbs, these sorts of stories will become encoded among the slaves in the African tradition, particularly the animal trickster character who uses his native wit and guile rather than brute strength to overcome his more powerful adversaries. Uh, the stories of Br'er Rabbit, for example, and Br'er Fox and Br'er Bear, whose eternal adversaries will be a popular part of the post-Civil War traditions of the South. That is, stories told by slaves and recorded by folklorists, eventually finding their way into the mainstream like Walt Disney's Uncle Remus stories, a movie made in the 1950, or even the Warner Brothers cartoon characters like Bugs Bunny, a wisecrack and carrot-chomping character who often overcame more powerful adversaries, drawn from the slave story traditions and the African traditions, fit metaphors for the slaves of empowerment, of overcoming despite the odds, Again, one physical, uh, physically superior adversaries. Equiano reminds us that every great event, such as a triumphant return from battle or other cause of public rejoicing, celebrated in public dances and accompanied with songs and music suited to the occasion. Sometimes slave owners would claim that uh, the songs of the slaves reflected their essential uh, contentment with slavery. Uh, but the songs weren't written to celebrate slavery. The songs were written to celebrate the human spirit of those enslaved and, and often, in fact, proved subversive to the interests of slavery as uh, slaves who were perhaps uh, prevented from speaking in such bold terms of freedom, of, bond, of release from bondage, could encode these lyrics and like a modern hip-hop rap uh, be preached, in effect, to an audience of listeners without endangering them. Uh, it was often the case that overseers and slave owners were not uh, hip to uh, the language of the slave songs, and thus uh, they could be sung defiantly and even boastfully without uh, endangering uh, or threatening uh, a risk of, of punishment. In fact, it was the very condescension of slave owners to think that these songs being African, being slave songs, were not somehow worth the time of, of listening to, you know, uh, thus rather subversively became part of a tradition of communication among enslaved people. Communication and empowerment. These African traditions often mixed with New World cultures, be they European or Native American, to create mixed traditions of what we call Creole Creole from the Latin word uh, to mean create, uh, the Spanish word creer, in fact, to create or blend. Uh, and a good example of that cultural blending in South Carolina among the, the coastal lowlands and the seacoast islands, the culture we come to know as Gullah, a mixed African-European culture. 
a famous painting here called The Old Plantation, uh, which was drawn around 1790. Uh, this famous painting shows Gullah slaves dancing and playing musical instruments derived from Africa. Now, for many years, scholars unaware of the Sierra Leone slave trade connection had interpreted the two female figures in particular as performing a scarf dance. But modern-day Sierra Leoneans could easily recognize that what they were really doing was playing a musical instrument. The shagura was a rattle instrument, uh, created uh, rhythmic sounds that could accompany the banjo, uh, the gourd, the, the various percussion instruments that might be improvised uh, as well. In fact, the banjo itself is thought to have derived from a West African instrument known as the mbanza. You can learn more about these song traditions by looking at the uh, Yale University website I feature here. Ways of working, ways of laboring were essential to the emerging identity of American societies, often reflecting their African forebears. Here you see a West African in the 20th century using a mortar and pestle, mortar and pestle technique to break rice husks, to break the seed from the husks. This tradition had been copied uh, and carried to the New World among the Gullah slaves of South Carolina where rice, African rice, became the chief cash crop. Unlike the tobacco of the Chesapeake, it was rice in Carolina using age-old laboring techniques and contributing to a new material culture, in this case the Gullah culture. Here you see a Gullah woman around the turn of the 20th century uh, posing for the photographer's camera with baskets. Baskets woven from materials made at hand in the African tradition, what comes to be known as the sweet grass basket of Carolina, which even today sold to tourists and others representing the extraordinary techniques of weaving and basket making inherited from Africa that becomes part of the New World culture, the Creole culture of the Western Hemisphere. Africa's influence also imprinted upon the material conditions of American life. The wearing of textiles, of, of brightly colored uh, dye textiles. A European visitor to West Africa uh, remarked that the women dye this cloth a rich and lasting blue color by the following simple process. The leaves of the indigo, when fresh gathered, are pounded in a wooden mortar and mixed in a large earthen jar with a strong lye of wood ashes. The cloth is steeped in this mixture and allowed to remain until it has acquired the proper shade. So famous for their brightly colored textiles, we're reminded that the enslaved people of the Americas carried that tradition of textile art, of weaving and dyeing, to the New World where they fabricated their own clothing often from the materials at hand, just as the painting, the plantation song painting from the 1790s reminds us of the brilliant colors and dye techniques, the intricacy of those techniques. And even the birth of New World cuisine from African traditions, a scene from a West African market today, reminds us that what we typically call southern cooking came from the traditions of Africa, the same traditions of the one-pot stew, the flame-cooked beef, the seasoning, all of it part of the dining and culinary traditions of West Africa that will mix in the Creole cultures of the Western Hemisphere, including the American South, where dishes like gumbo and jambalaya still are featured in the menus of uh, Southern cuisine. Here, this picture from uh, the theme park Dollywood uh, in Tennessee shows an African-American cook preparing in much the same ways as his West African forebearers. Uh, and words like gumbo and jambalaya, in fact, are African words attesting to the culinary traditions of the African people.
Okay, so Africans in English America, an introduction to the enduring cultural influences of African people who though were enslaved, nevertheless imprinted upon their societies traditions that would continue down, musical, dance, uh, culinary, textile, and storytelling traditions, for example, that would endure down uh, to our own time. This was a story not simply of English people in the Americas, but Africans as well, who mixed and combined their traditions with those of the New World.